Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan, and I'm here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and participating in our Hearing and Vision Screening webinar. We have a lot of great information to cover, and I hope that you will find this session useful. Before I turn the time over to Mary Ellen, who is our Hearing and Vision Screening Specialist with School Health, uh, I'd like to review a few quick things about today's presentation. First, we will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. Our presenters are going to speak for about 45 minutes, after which we will be able to answer your questions in the order in which they were received. Uh, for those attending live today, uh, we are uh, recording the webinar and we will be sending a link out to you after the webinar has finished. Uh, so that you can rewatch this if there's uh, anything that you would like to review or, or to be able to see again or to share with colleagues. Um, we will also be sending your certificate of uh, participation for this webinar in that same email and that will come out later this afternoon. Uh, lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly at 855 three five two nine zero zero three again if you are having technical difficulties please call go to webinar directly at eight five five three five two nine zero zero three and now i'll turn the time over to mary ellen thank you ryan um good afternoon everyone and welcome to another webinar from school health um, as we present to you today hearing and vision screenings you know, struggling with catching up. Oh, I'm already having trouble. There we go. I wanted to just thank everyone who's joining us today and a special welcome to our uh, members of AEPA who are joining us on, on the call. So we have a lot of really good information and we want to make sure that we spend enough time getting through all of it and have the ability to answer those questions that might come through. So we're going to get started right away. Today's discussion is going to really center around the importance of vision and hearing screenings. Uh, we want to just take a look back at why we're doing that, uh, talk about some of the evidence-based options and tools that are out there um, for your use, uh, ways that you can catch up. We know that everybody has really been challenged in the last year, and so we want to give you some really great tips and tricks on how to do that. Uh, we're also going to review some of the questions that people did send in in advance, and thank you so much for those of you who registered and gave us some of those questions. Um, we have a lot of resources for you that we're going to make available through this webinar. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about school health and the partnerships that we have, um, you know, through our contracts and other means today. So right away, I'd like you to meet Dr. Carrie Browning, who's a licensed audiologist working with MAKO uh, in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Carrie has been um, in this um, setting of hearing screening as an audiologist for over 20 years. She has been uh, working with MAKO for the past nine years as a product manager, um, and she works in the development of all of the audiology products that they have available. So uh, Carrie, we're gonna let you get started right away here. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Kay, um, Mary Ellen. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you everyone for participating. Um, just to get started, we, I wanted to go through some of the registration questions that we asked and some of your responses that were given. Um, the, some of the, the items were the number of students to screen. We know that you have a lot of catch up to do. That's the purpose of this presentation. But not only do you have this year's screenings to work on, but of course, possibly last year's students that missed those screenings as well. So um, there's a huge amount to be done. We also know that there's a shortage of staff or a shortage of volunteers that can assist with this. So that's a huge issue. Um, another item that was mentioned within the questions was just the kids aren't in the school. Either they're still continuing to do distance learning, you know, more kids are out because they're sick. And even when they are there, the, the process just takes longer um, to, you know, quite get the kids to where you're actually doing the, the screenings or because the, some of the kids are out performing the screenings can take longer because you have to go back through those lists and find those kids that weren't there on the screening day. 
Um, and then just finding the time. We know that you have many added responsibilities, even in normal years, but now with COVID, definitely those added responsibilities take time as well, and that can impact your screenings too. Next slide, please. So what we, I want to go over first um, is just the importance of hearing screenings. Next slide, please. So one is that hearing is a hidden disability. Um, it is not. It can go undetected by family and educators for many months or years before it is actually diagnosed. And by offering screenings periodically in the schools, the goal is really to find these kids as quickly as possible and get them the, the, the treatment that they need. Next slide, please. Also with the importance, um, we know that hearing loss is one of the most is the most common birth defect in the United States. One out of three in a thousand births will will have hearing loss. And also that increases to six out of 10 out of a thousand children in the school age population. So it is something that you do need to monitor throughout their life. There's an estimated 20% of all cases of the childhood hearing loss are acquired after the newborn hearing screening. And also 15% of the school aged children between the ages of six to nine years of age have some degree or type of hearing loss, which can impact the education. And that's really what it comes down. This is impacting their education. Next slide, please. So it, impacting the child's development, what, did, what happens? Well, definitely you're going to see problems with speech and hearing development. Um, you're also going to have some academic performance issues can certainly occur. Um, personal and social interactions can be impacted because of hearing loss and just the emotional well-being of that child. Children with permanent hearing loss are at an increased risk of showing emotional and behavioral difficulties. This is really the main message that we want to get across. We want to conduct these hearing screenings so we can identify those children um, and have their, the services that they need. Um, just because it will improve the quality of life. This is really to make sure that they are ready to achieve their most maximum potential. Next slide, please. So why do we screen in the preschool, the elementary school, the middle school, or even the high school programs? Well, because we know that even though the new, newborn hearing screenings are, you know, about 98% of the kids, of babies are screened within the United States. And that was a statistic from 2019. And it's a very high, like we, we def definitely do get these babies screened in the United States, but there's 30% of those babies are lost to follow up. So either the, they're not going back for a rescreen that may be necessary, the parents just don't have the time or ability, or you know, they're just not taking those kids to the, to the doctor to kind of finish up that screening program so that they can truly be evaluated throughout the entire process. Also, we need to keep in mind that you might not have any record of screening. So that could be those that 30% that were lost to follow up may not have that screening on file. But also these, these children that are born out of the United States and don't have any me medical records to provide to you, that's something else. We wanna make sure that we have all of these kids um, have the appropriate screenings that they need. Another item is just otitis media. This is a very common within the children um, population. I mean, just this, these ear infections that just um, really impact th those little kids and, and it impacts the transmission of sound. So they just are not hearing things normally and certainly medical attention is needed. Um, this is something that is prevalent in those younger children and especially prevalent during those key language development years. And so we really want to have this addressed immediately. Another item of, you know, why do we want to screen is just later onset. This is not something that is, you know, only at birth. Hearing loss does develop later in life. And as I mentioned earlier, six out of 10 out of those 1,000 children um, acquire that hearing loss in the school age population. It's something that does need to be monitored throughout the, the child's life. Studies have reported that the neonatal hearing screening programs would not detect 10 to 20% of ca cases of permanent childhood hearing loss. And the American Academy of Pediatric recommends that regardless of the newborn hearing status, ongoing checking of children's hearing should be completed during the well child visit. So they see the importance of really monitoring this throughout the, the child's life. Another item is just that we're seeing a prevalence of noise-induced hearing loss in kids too, with earbuds and headphone uses by so many kids these days. You know, hearing loss can acquire because of the high-intensity sounds. 
And so even in some states, they've incorporated six to 8,000 hertz as an additional frequencies that they want tested in these older pop in the middle to high schools, just because they know that it is a problem. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics has incorporated this for children 11 years and older within their recommendations. And then my last item is why do we screen in the schools? It's just because you have access. Um, we know that far fewer uh, well child visits are being um, actually completed than what is recommended. And because you have um, the, the children there, having the hearing screenings in the school really allows for this piece to be checked and monitored due to the huge impact to their education. Next slide, please. So we have, within hearing screenings, we have two tests that are evidence-based and available um, to be able to be performed. And this presentation is not to go exactly how to perform those tests. This is just to give you an overview of what those tests are. Next slide, please. So the first one to mention is just otoacoustic emissions. This is primarily used for kids zero to three years of age. Um, it certainly can be used for children that are older than three years of age. It's just that it's been really um, recommended to use it for the zero to three. It also can be used for those kids that just are developmentally are not able to perform a peer tone test. So, or they, you, they just can't get that, that understand what they need to do. So it, it certainly can be used for older kids as well. Um, the, this test is an objective test. There is no need for the child to do any type of response so that you know that they heard it. So, and it, and it really is nice because it gives you an automated, pa automate, automated pass or refer result um, at the end of that completion of the test. And of course, it's really quick. It can take less than two minutes per child. So both ears can be tested very, very quickly with autoacoustic emissions. The second test that we have is the pure tone audiometry. And this is really the gold standard uh, for hearing screenings. This is where, you know, they, you, they hear a beep and they tell you that they heard it. So it does require a subjective response. It is for kids three years and older. And those three-year-olds are probably gonna be a bit challenging as well. But hopefully if they understand the process, you know, they certainly can, can complete it. The time it does take, I'm, I said two to five minutes here and, and even longer it can take, especially for those younger kids. So just keep that in mind. But if you have, some, if you have a child that has normal hearing, is older, you can really complete that hearing screening really relatively quickly. Um, and the other aspect of this is that you do have to, the screener does have to re record those responses. The thing with the peer tone audiometry is that it really, it, it's a cognitive response. It has to go through that in, entire auditory path with presenting the tone, they have actually hearing it and them actually telling you that they hear it. And which is why it really is the gold standard for uh, hearing screenings. Next slide, please. So, to get to the, the topic is just catching up. How do we how do we do that? How within all these kids that I have to screen, how can how can I catch up with what I need to do? Well, what I first wanted to just present to you was just some of the definitions of what screening is. So ASHA, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association, says that a hearing screening is used to identify individuals who may require more comprehensive hearing assessment or medical management. It is supposed to be a quick test to see how well they hear the different sounds, and it either is a pass or a fail. Uh, the World Health Organization refers to the screening as a sorting process. I wanna know who are normal and who need further attention. And then the AAA, or American Academy of Audiology, states that the primary purpose, purpose of hearing screening program is to identify children with previously undiagnosed permanent hearing loss. Um, we know that screenings are not going to be 100% accurate. It really is the sorting process to find those that we need to make sure that they have the next steps in place. Um, and it, but it just, is, gives, it just gives us a high probability um, of someone that is at risk for a condition versus those that are not. And so that's why we wanna do the screenings and really find those kids and make sure that they get the, the treatment and the diagnosis that they need. Next slide, please. So how can I catch up? Um, so I have a little, a few items here that maybe it's, this, these will help you in your process. One is just review your guidelines. Do you know what is required for your state screening guidelines? 
And are you following those? And not saying, and the reason I say this is because I, I see many times that people are going above and beyond what they actually need to do or what the state asks them or requires them to do. You know, if they, if the state doesn't want you to obtain threshold measurements on that child, then is it, is it necessary for you to do that? And I am not here to say it is or it isn't. I'm just, my job right now is to really figure out how can you get through the mass amount of kids that are, are needed to be screened. So the one thing I would say is that if you do have a referral source that you are sending these children to, I would talk to that referral source and I would find out truly what is it that you need from, from my hearing screening. Do, if I do collect threshold measurements, do you use those for your evaluation or do you like to have a clean slate? So it is one, truly looking at the guidelines, finding out what you really are required to do. And then the second is talking to those referral sources and making sure that the information that you give to them is something that they even use. Um, sometimes the, the professional just wants a clean slate that because that what happened on the day of your screening was for that particular day. So, you know, maybe it doesn't provide them any value. And if you're taking more time to obtain that additional information, um, maybe it could be well, well served getting through more of the children. Next slide, please. Um, and so the next one is, uh, uh, one was, uh, I think we messed up here, but there know your equipment or adjust your settings. One of the things that I wanted to make sure is that the more familiar and comfortable you are with the equipment, the quicker you are going to be with, with using it and screening those kids. Um, of course, at the end of the year, if you've been screening kids for a variety of times throughout the year, you're probably pretty comfortable with that equipment, but maybe at the beginning of the year, you're kind of a little bit more clumsy with it. So one is just really uh, know your equipment before you start screenings or it's been a while, maybe just kind of test some your spouse or some family members or some friends just to kind of get some, get comfortable with the buttons and how quickly you need to adjust those knobs. But the other thing to keep in mind is that there are settings typically within the device that can allow you to to cycle through frequencies quicker or, or cycle through the levels quicker. Um, and this may only at, you know, provide you seconds of um, less time, but throughout the entire day when you're screening, you know, 50 to 100 kids, that time definitely adds up. Looking at those settings, so it's not something that, well, I, I accidentally tested the wrong frequency, so then I have to go back. So those are a lot of times within devices, you can, you can turn those frequencies off. The second or the, the third item here is just train in a group setting. So, um, you know, go into the classroom, talk to the group, the kids as a group, let them know what you're going to be doing for the hearing screening, bring in the audiometer so they can see it as well. You know, really, you know, go through the entire process with them. A lot of times you can bring that audiometer in, turning it all the way up and presenting the tone so that you can all hear it. Um, if it's a you know, small enough room, you can certainly do that. Obviously, it would never be on the child when you're doing that, but it allows them to hear, actually hear what is being presented and that, you know, where you can reinforce, that's what you want to hear, and that's when you notify me that you did hear it. So training in a group setting really can cut down on time. And then once they come into for the actual screening, it can be a, a much a lesser conversation or training with them on what you're asking them to do. So hopefully that can give you some, some added minutes within the screening program or process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, limit tone presentations. What this means is that you don't want to continuously present tones until you finally get a response. If you know that that child is, is, is or isn't hearing them, you know, it's not something that we, we, present continuously. Really, you should never present within a screening program, you should never present more than four tone presentations. Um, you know, if you're, and if they're getting a really good, strong, if you're getting a really good, strong response at that first presentation, you can take it and run with it. You know, if you, if you, they say, it, I heard it and it, you can tell when a child is hearing something or not, you, you're, you're, you're well, um, accustomed to this. You've been screening many, many kids. So if you're confident that that child is hearing the tone, you know, let's move on to that next frequency. But really don't, if you're, if they're not hearing it, and if it's a refer, don't continuously present these tones. You know, may try to train them once or twice again at a higher level. But then once you're at that screening level, just, you know, move on um, and, and mark them as a refer and come back to them in, an, in a couple weeks if need be to do the research to do the rescreening, but don't take so much time on that one initial screening if, if you don't have the time. And the next, next slide, please. OAE is another option. As we know, it can be a much 
quicker screening process. And during this COVID times, um, some states have allowed OAEs to be used for all ages. If that is the case in your particular state and you have an OAE device, then I certainly would recommend it because it can be a much quicker process, at least for those younger kids where it's, it tends to take more time for that, for that uh, screening day. Next slide, please. And what about volunteers or even outside screening companies? This was something uh, also within provided within those questions that we ask you, what are you doing to, to help you know, with your screenings. And a lot of people said that, you know, we have transitioned to an out outside screening company. So check within your area to see if there's even an opportunity for that. Of course, using volunteers as well is an option, even though there, you may have some restrictions with that. Um, you know, maybe they can't come into the schools or something like that. But if you are able to use volunteers, maybe they're not able to actually perform the screenings, but maybe they're able to help you get the kids you know, into the room, or they can be, you know, cleaning the devices as, you know, you're moving to the next child, or, you know, really look at all of the different tasks that you have to perform within that screening day and find out maybe where there's some avenues where some volunteers might be able to assist you with that if they're not able to actually do the, the actual screenings. If they're able to do the screenings, then um, excellent. You know, certainly try to get them in to help you as much as possible when you have those screening days. Next slide, please. And then I'll have all tools available as well as check your equipment. The worst thing that happens is if you go starting your screening day, you're pulling some kids and then you find out, you know, that your audiometer isn't working. Um, you know, having it checked period, obviously you want to have it checked annually for calibration purposes, but also doing those biologic checks on the day of the screening to make sure that that piece of the equipment is working as well. Um, and then just having all of your tools. You don't want to have, you know, you know, your cleaning disinfectants way on the other side of the room. Have everything right beside you so that you can really just focus on the kids, getting them into that chair and, and starting the screening process. And this is where I was saying that maybe some volunteers can help you if they can't perform the screenings, you know, have maybe they can be doing some documentation for you. Maybe they can be cleaning one, an audiometer, disinfecting it while, you know, maybe hopefully you have two audiometers. They could be cleaning one as you use the other one on another child, you know, looking at all of the different tasks that you have and seeing if um, any help is, is available. But of course, having your tools available for you or by you. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And um, I think we'll take questions at the end unless there's anything that I can answer right now. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I think that we will take some questions at the end. One really quick question is, uh, you know, you talked about limited, limiting the tone presentations for uh, the audiometers. Uh, you know, if they're not hearing that tone and, and not uh, responding, is it a good time then to switch them regardless of age over to that OAE to see if you can at least get that um, pass or refer on the child? Yeah, so that would be really nice if you have access to both of those devices. And if that child is just not... Uh... Uh, responding to the the pure tones, you know, find out switching them to the OAE and seeing what happens there would be would be a, a great solution. Um, you know, if you don't have the OAE devices, it's really is trying to like we said, it's a sorting process. We want to find out those that need further attention versus those that are you know really have normal and you know that right away. So it's it's really just sorting that child to those that okay I need I know I need to rescreen this particular child or you know find the referral source that that uh, they may need some some attention okay we did have a few other questions that came in so we'll take those at the end right now we're going to move on to the vision screening portion and I want to take this opportunity to introduce to all of you uh, Dr. K Nottingham Chapman um, Kay's joining us now, and Kay has over 21 years of experience in vision screening. Uh, she's a former director of training um, at, at the Vision Initiatives for Children in West Virginia um, at the University's Eye Institute. Um, she's a consultant for, for many committees, including APOS. Um, she's also a consultant for the Vision and Eye Health Initiative at School Health. Um, uh, she's an education and outreach coordinator at Prevent Blindness, working prim primarily with the National Center for Prevent Blindness. Um, and I could go on and on and on, but her main focus is to encourage age-appropriate and evidence-based um, vision screening um, 
to, to meet your, your state and national guidelines. So, Kay, um, I'm going to let you take it away here um, and go through your presentation. Thank you, Mary Ellen, and thanks to all of you who are in attendance. And I am very excited to be part of this panel. So as you see here, we are talking about playing catch up. And I'm guessing just from looking at the wonderful responses that you provided during registration that you probably feel like this middle image of the person on the treadmill. But I did want you to know that you're not alone. Um, I saw many, many, many responses regarding we just can't do this, we're trying, we're, 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 do, we're doing what we can, so you are not alone. Next slide, please. Oops. Sorry, okay, there we go. I'm still looking at the treadmill person. Oh, oh I thought, let's see, is that it? Can you see it? No. Hmm. Let me see what happened here. Give me one second. I'm sorry. Don't know what happened there. Okay. Thank you. So I just pulled three uh, comments from the registration comments just to sort of set the scene here. And one was students have gone a full year not knowing they have a vision deficit. Some students haven't been screened for two years. And some students have missed their screenings and students have gone with unidentified vision loss. Next slide, please. Hmm. Sorry, Kay, I'm having a small technical issue here. So while we are fixing this technical issue, ooh, whoa, big picture. Um, just wanted to, those of you who do feel like you are on that treadmill, take a deep breath and just relax for a moment. Okay, so why is this a problem? The three comments that I shared before. Um, a, two, a, a review paper published in 2020 found evidence suggesting an association between reduced visual acuity and uncorrected refractive error in children and academic performance. And I know that all of you know this, but I just thought you might find it interesting that this did uh, come out of a review paper, a very recent review paper, to confirm what we know. Next slide, please. So how is clear vision helpful for students? It plays a role, clear vision plays a role in healthy development, ability to learn, as we just showed you on the previous slide, a child's self-esteem and confidence even, athletic ability, and improved classroom behavior. And I do have studies showing a definite improvement in classroom behavior after a child was screened and received treatment. So as Dr. Carey had mentioned earlier, it's, it's a hidden um, disorder unless a child has an eye that's clearly out of alignment or ptosis where the eyelid's drooping or nystagmus where the eyes are jumping. We can't see that kids can't see and most of the time kids can't tell us that they can't see. So by screening vision and helping families getting an eye exam after a uh, post-screening referral, you play an important role in helping to make children, in helping to make sure that these children have clear vision, the best vision possible, and the best opportunity for learning. Next slide, please. So here's another paper talking about the problem. This was actually published online in December 2021. 
looking at different states that were still vision screening, modified vision screening and so forth, um, did not find information on all states and did not name the states, but does provide some information for the field. So during the latter half, of the 2019-2020 academic year, schools suspended in-person activities. Now, for those of you in attendance who screen vision, think of the students that you are responsible for screening. How many? And the reason I ask that is because suspended in-person activities affected 50 million students across the United States. Next slide, please. So with all of COVID, we have widespread use of virtual learning, increased screen time, decreased time outdoors, and an increase in, my, in myopia among children worldwide. So, when you look at these concerns, delayed or missed vision screening should be recognized, according to the authors, as an emerging public health concern as these may impact children's vision health. Next slide, please. So 11 of 39 states and Washington, D.C with vision screening guidelines, modified vision screening. And these modifications, I noticed a lot of you were already doing. doing. So the modifications including um, using personal protective equipment for screeners, moving screeners outdoors or to open areas such as gymnasiums, limiting vision screening components. I noticed that a lot of you chose to do this. For example, not doing color vision deficiency screening or stereo acuity and using disposable occluders or adhesive patches. Six states that the authors uh, could find information about had actually waived vision screening. Next slide, please. So a suggested solution, according to the authors, is to implement measures to make up missed screenings or to catch up. So uh, screen division of grades missed the prior year or years and dedicate screening events for students in remote learning. Next slide. conduct abbreviated vision screening, such as doing only distance visual acuity for ages three years through high school, or instrument-based screening for children ages one, two, three, four, and five years. Again, many of you are doing this. And educating the school community about emerging risk factors for pediatric vision disorders that can help you prioritize screening. Next slide, please. So when you need to prioritize, you can also look at screening students ages three, four, and five years because of the emerging research showing a relationship between high hyperopia and low emerging literacy skills. This is important time, as you know, for learning. Check the status of your past referrals and contact families to at least try to get um, eye exams for those kiddos who did not have an eye exam and screen students at higher risk for vision disorders, uh, for example, from teacher or parent referrals. Again, many of you are doing this. Next slide, please. So here's a document I wanted to share that uh, with you that you could share with teachers and parents to help gather information about prioritizing students. And this comes from our vision screening guidelines by age webpage at the National Center. The link is below. Next slide, please. So these are signs of possible vision problems in children. So you have how, they, how the eyes appear. The behavior is a child, for example, covering one eye when reading. Um, 
and complaints, which you're not going to receive often from younger kids, but you might have a three and a half year old say the light is too bright. Um, I've had that occur. So this is a document you can download and share with teachers or other folks in your program. Next slide, please. And this is a document you could actually send home to parents and caregivers to complete and return. Next slide, please. So this is a checkoff sheet. Um, the last page includes information about making a NIE exam, financial resources, and so forth. But this is a way to help you prioritize those children for uh, students, children for screening. Next slide, please. So evidence-based tools, I didn't have enough time to get into that. So this is a link to a table of nine pages starting from birth all the way through high school. Um, it includes optotype screening, instrument-based screening, color, stereo acuity, and so forth. So this link will lead you to evidence-based vision screening tools. Next slide, please. So for right now, um, or in the next month or so, some evidence-based vision screening tools for quick screening. If you're still going to um, do just partial screening. So for critical line screening, some of you may be uh, familiar with this sight line chart that looks like this. You see the picture. We're working on a new one. Um, and the new one, the new kit, will include Sloan letters as well, so it could be used for all ages for just critical line screening. And then instrument-based screening, again, for ages one, two, three, four, and five years. And this is a picture of spot that I just, that I'm using just in, as an example. Um, so the, the list that I showed you before will list the uh, tools that are evidence-based and accepted at Prevent Blindness. Next slide, please. So we want to use evidence-based tools, and I noticed that some of you were using some occluders that probably, well, that actually were not evidence-based. So I just want to talk about this briefly. So the eye patches on the left and the two inch wide surgical tape are okay for, and Mary Ellen, thank you for moving the mouse, for all ages. The flip up glasses in the middle bottom are for ages three years up to age 10 years. And then the lollipop occluders and the Mardi Gras mask are for children ages 10 years and older. Next slide, please. So what is unacceptable? No hands, not child's hand, not teacher's hand, not an adult's hand, no hands, no tissues, no paper or plastic cups. And for up until age 10, years, no cover paddles. And the reason being is that it's very easy for a child to peek around those occluders, especially if you're covering a good eye and having them look at whatever at the chart out of their poor eye and they can easily peek and then you can have under referrals. Next slide, please. So some of you talked about parents opting out of vision screening or not scheduling and, att and attending a confirmatory eye examination. As you well know, this is not a problem that just came about as a result of the pandemic. This is ongoing. And we at the National Center are actually developing um, information to help take a deeper dive into why the eye exam does not occur that will not be ready for a bit of time. So what you can do now when you're talking with parents is simply ask 
how would you feel if your child needed to wear glasses? You can gather a lot of information from that question. Um, it could be something as simple as it's a cultural belief that if my daughter is wearing glasses, she may not be able to find a marriage partner. Um, and then asking what needs to occur for your child to get an eye exam and that will help bring up maybe some barriers or cultural beliefs and then working with those parents to develop actually an individualized follow-up treatment plan and I know you're thinking I don't have time for this I can't even screen vision but as time permits and this may help you if you're looking at those kiddos who had a referral but didn't uh, get to an eye exam. Next slide, please. This is, uh, we created small steps for big vision, which is all around parent education about the importance of good vision for their children. We have it in English and Spanish. This is the link. Please allow about a minute for the page to load as we are redesigning that page. But we've found parents who just were uncomfortable not knowing how to make an eye exam or, you know, or what's the connection between vision and learning or vision and classroom behaviors. So these are handouts, again, English and Spanish that could go home to parents um, or could be emailed as a link. Next slide, please. So just wanted to share uh, four resources with you. Vision screening is just one piece of 12 components of a strong vision health system of care. So when you have time, please take a look at these 12 components. And it starts out with parent education. The vision health program evaluation on the right is the last piece of the 12 components and it's looking at your vision health program annually, picking one or two things to work on if you find a deficit in that area. Again, not something you have time to do now, but please keep it in mind for when time becomes available. Next slide, please. Um, this is digital vis uh, children's vision digital screen tips and I don't know what may happen with COVID, whether we'll have another variant, I don't, I, I don't know, but I just did want you to know about this resource and School Health also has this resource about guidelines for screening during COVID, just, just in case you need to look at it again. Next slide, please. So I do thank you for your time and attention. I hope there was something in there that may make your work a little bit easier. This is my contact info. And that was my happy dance for saying thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I did have one quick question before we move on and then we'll get to some more. Um, could you um, elaborate a little bit on the difference between doing a critical line uh, exam or a screening and a threshold screening? Um, and why it's acceptable to, to do it um, and it shortens that period of time? Okay, so this is an example of full threshold where you start at the top, I'm backwards here, where you start at the top, move all the way down the chart until they miss at um, three out of five and then the line above that is the visual acuity for that eye and then you, so you're doing threshold. You're trying to get them as low as they can go and also maybe find a two-line difference between the eyes, which could even be in the passing area. Then critical line, this is an example of the sight line um, that I showed you earlier, and this is just the line. It's one card per eye. And it's just the line that children need to pass according to their age. So this is much faster and it is accepted by 
the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Certified Orthoptists, the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, or APOS, and the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Those joint guide, guidelines do recommend critical line screening for faster screening. Did that answer your question? It did. So you can't do a critical line screen with a threshold test, correct? You can, but it's not recommended. We don't because really the have the problem. research to know um, whether it works as, as as well. We just don't know. So if, if need be, you could, but let's say you're doing this line, just make sure if you do show that line only that you have as much, like try not to show, ignore my thumb, the line below. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why the crowding bar is really important on that critical line, correct? Yeah. Yes. Because this, even with this chart, you still lose crowding at the front and the back side, but you're still getting the, the middle. So there's enough going on here that you do have the crowding. And I apologize if I'm making y'all dizzy. But this um, this box, this crowding rectangle does provide the, the crowding. And now why is that important? Because if you're showing like just this line without the box, you're not having crowding and it can make the optotypes easier to identify and you can under refer children. You should have known not to ask me those questions because I go on and on and on. Sorry. That's okay, Kay. Those were that's great and a lot of really, really good information. So thank you. Um, so before we take a few more questions, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about school health, um, why school health makes a great partnership. Um, for you um, with all your vision and hearing needs. Uh, we have a dedicated national sales team. Um, we also have the ability to work with you to help leverage your existing contracts or buying groups that you might have. Um, I myself am the vision and hearing specialist. I'm always available to help answer any questions, uh, work with you on um, training um, for the equipment um, and work with you on uh, your programs for hearing and vision. Um, all of our, our sales team is certified and licensed to be able to train you on the equipment, and we work really together on that. We also carry a real robust inventory level, so as you're working through these challenges of trying to catch up on your vision screening, you know, School Health does have uh, the Sightline book. We do have um, the OAE and the audiometers readily available for our inventory levels that we keep so that they can help you get through that. Um, we also have a service department, especially for your equipment um, that you might need to have calibrated or any of your equipment that you might need to have looked at. You want to, as you heard, you want to have all that equipment ready to go um, in good condition so that it makes the screenings go quickly for you. So we have all of that available. Um, just to reiterate some of the evidence-based options for hearing screenings that are out there, we have the MAKO Euroscan OAE, which is that handheld unit that do, gives you a pass refer. Um, it's perfect for any ages. It is recommended for those younger um, children who do not respond quickly to the audiometers. Um, I'm just highlighting one, uh, one of our audiometers that we have out there, which is the MA27. Um, we also have a, another variety of them. And then we have the pilot test audiometer. That pilot test audiometer is really um, a great tool for those kids that are younger, um, you know, that, that kind of fall in between knowing whether or not they know what they're, they're doing and can respond or, or, or understand how to respond to an audiometer. Um, this is a two-in-one test. It has select picture for those children who, who can't really perform that pure tone test. And then it also has a pure tone test in it so you can get a wider range of of children screened. Um, all of the audiometers that we carry have a new headset that uh, can be, uh, that goes with them uh, in a version where you've got um, a newer headset that is a much more adjustable headband. 
Um, it, it goes around the ear so that um, you're really cushioning the outside of the ears. It's much more comfortable and easier to use, and it only has one cord. So you're not trying to put that on and then um, have these cords hanging down. You've got one cord. Makes it a lot easier to work with um, when you're, you're screening your children. And then for our vision screening, of course, we have the Sightline Kit. Uh, that's that critical line um, flip book that has all your occluders in there. Uh, Dr. K went through the appropriate occluders and we give you those along with a cord that allows you to measure out um, the right distance. It comes with the layout symbols, which are those optotypes that make it easy for everyone to, to look at. And this is, of course, something that's been recommended by the National Expert Panel at the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health that prevent blindness. We also carry two kind of spot vision screeners, which can help increase um, your um, screening, uh, make it go a little bit quicker for you. We have the screener itself alone, and then we also carry a version with visual acuity charts that are out there so that you can get your visual acuity scores while you're doing your instrument-based screening on that as well. Um, and so I want to just say thank you. Um, again, my name is Mary Ellen O'Keefe-Smith, and I am the Senior Specialist for the Electronic Health Records, Vision, and Hearing Screenings. I want to thank uh, Dr. Carey and Dr. K for being a part of this today, and I think we have a little time to take some questions. So I'm going to just um, see what we have out here that we can uh, take a look at. So going to go back a little bit here. Um, so Carrie, um, Dr. Carrie, the, the first question I'm going to ask you uh, came from Michelle Davis. She asked if uh, you recommend rescreening before referring for a, for, for a full audiology evaluation for those young students, those ones that are pre-K through 12, uh, pre-K through two, grade two. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think once a child does uh, end up with a refer on that initial screen, the best approach is to rescreen them in about two weeks so that you can determine is this consistent? Um, you never want to over refer, but of course, if there is any concern, you want to get them to a professional. So also look within your state guidelines because it's, I, from what I've read, in most states, it's very specific on their recommendations on how to proceed with those children as well. Okay, um, uh, I think this one applies to both, but uh, Dr. Carey, if you want to start, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, cleaning in between each, uh, each student's use, especially for the um, audiometers? I mean, is it okay to use alcohol wipes, um, or is that bad for the equipment? Is peroxide okay, or benzo wipes? I mean, this, this is a question that came through from a Debbie Suter. Um, yeah, so definitely you are going to want to disinfect any piece of the equipment that touches the child. So um, there are particular disinfectant wipes that you want to be using. You do not want to be using alcohol because, um, I, yeah, there are certain, certain products that you should be using. Alcohol will actually um, can deteriorate the, the, the rubber cushion on the, on the headphones. You know, they can make it hard and crack and brittle and that type of thing. So make sure you are using the appropriate disinfectant wipes when you're cleaning the equipment. Now, and Dr. K, I know that, you know, a lot of the um, charts, um, you know, are easily wiped down um, with uh, any kind of wipe. Anything else that you want to add as far as cleaning? Yeah, just cleaning the occluders, which gives me an opportunity to apologize if I offended anyone when I said some of you weren't using proper occluders, because I know you're doing the best you can. Um, so yes, they should be wiped down. The, any, as Dr. Carey said, anything that touches the child, and I know that will take extra time. Okay. Uh, Dr. K, this is another one for you, and I, I think you kind of touched on this on one of your resources. You said, uh, uh, so Tina um, asked the question of, how do you get parents to comply with vision screening? Again, um, sharing, first of all, finding out why, because it may be a cultural belief in, in some cultures, um, Everything is is religious, 
and so they don't want screening to occur because if there could be a problem they'll take care of it at church so always just digging a little digging a little bit deeper and just trying to if possible find out and then talk about the importance of vision and learning at school and if um, learning in sports that may help unfortunately this has been a situation that's been ongoing for years and years and years and years and we don't have the full answer but we're working on it great question thank you uh carrie uh dr carrie i should say sorry um we had a question that um uh, uh from kara uh, she wanted to know um, why speech pathologists in schools may not or can't perform hearing and vision tests, and sometimes it falls to the nurses to have to do something like that. Well, honestly, I, I really can't answer that. All I know is that every state does require, like every state is different, <laughs> is, right. is probably the answer on that. So it would just be checking in with your state, and sometimes there's a certification that's required. So um, that would be a great question to, to talk to your state about. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. It's really based on the state for sure. And if um, I could just chime in also um, with vision screening, same thing would depend on the state, but I have trained and certified and am training and certifying speech therapists to do vision screening so again it just it's it's possible can be done depends on your state thank you okay um so i think this is good for for both of you um should an elementary student be rescreened if their initial screening failed i think it's kind of close to what you you answered before um Dr. Carey, uh, a little bit, but Kay, I don't know if you wanted to chime in on that. Um, okay, so the answer is it depends. If you're <laughs> st if you start vision screening, you start with that observation form that I'd shared earlier with the appearance, behavior, and complaints. You start that using that before you actually use a tool. So if a student has check marks on in, on that document, but passes vision screening tool, you still make a referral. Now, if the child does not pass vision screening, then the recommendation is to do a rescreening. Did I say, did I miss the word? If a vision, if a child does not pass vision screening, and you have the opportunity to screen that child again before making a referral, just so uh, you feel very comfortable about making that referral and parents are having to take time off from work, then do rescreen. The recommendation is <clears throat> same day if possible and no later than six months. And I would say with an elementary child, I would not wait six months. I would do two or three weeks. Okay. Uh, Dr. Carey, um, with regards to the equipment, um, what about calibration of that equipment? Well, from a manufacturer's perspective, we're always going to recommend that that um, equipment is calibrated on a yearly basis. Um, but also, if you look at your state guidelines, they also require that equipment to be calibrated on a yearly basis. So just to make sure that your equipment is functioning appropriately, um, as you have those kids at the screening, at the time of the screening, um, to not delay anything, absolutely checking that equipment on a yearly basis is, is strongly recommended. Thanks. And I would just add, probably required by state. It is, yes. And I would just add that the, 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 the instrument-based screener, the spot vision screener that um, we supply through School Health does not require uh, any calibration um, be done on any, any basis. So, um, Actually, we're at time, and so I want to just thank everybody again. Thank our AEPA members who joined us today. Um, if you have any additional questions um, that we didn't get to, we will 
um, you know, try to answer those um, for you. And thank you again for your time.